Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Webster, Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar. Women's History Month is held annually in March to celebrate the contributions of women in history and contemporary society. To honour this month and to celebrate Carnegie Mellon's position as a national leader in supporting women in computing, we are honoured to showcase the work of Dr. Carol Fries and Dr. Julia Quesenberry. This evening's event draws its inspiration from the book of the title of this event, Kicking Butt in Computer Science, Women in Computing at Carnegie Mellon and Around the World, which tells the story of how Carnegie Mellon University developed a culture and environment in which women could thrive and be successful in computer science. Our School of Computer Science delivers one of the top ranked computer science programs in the world, and with a considerably higher percentage of female students than the norm, now comprising around half of incoming graduates and undergraduates each fall. Carol has said, women at CMU are not simply part of the culture, they are helping to build the culture in which both men and women can succeed. This evening, Carol and Juria will discuss the various obstacles and catalysts that help determine women's participation in the rapidly growing field of computing. Dr. Carol Fries is Director of Women at SCS and SCS for All in the School of Computer Science at CMU. She gained her doctorate in the field of cultural studies in computer science from the School of Computer Science, and her research interests include the culture of computing broadening participation in computing fields, diversity issues, gender myth, and stereotypes. And Carol will be retiring this year after 20 years of work in the School of Computer Science, and we wish her a very happy retirement. Dr. Julia Quesenberry is an Associate Teaching Professor of Information Systems in Carnegie Mellon's Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences, where she also serves as Associate Dean of Faculty. Julia teaches in the areas of global systems, social informatics, the strategic value of information systems, and web design and development. And her research interests are directed at the study of cultural influences on information technology students and professionals. And she received the 2014 Elliot Dunlop Smith Award for Distinguished Teaching and Educational Service. After we've heard from our guest speakers, uh, we will be joined by one of our faculty members from the University Libraries, Dr. Emma Slayton, who is our Data Curation, Visualization and GIS Specialist, to moderate a discussion with our presenters. Before I hand over to Carol, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the University Libraries, Marketing, Communications and External Relations team for coordinating this event to the university's media tech team for making the technology work beautifully and a particular thanks to women in history of science and technology for making the event possible. Um, I'm sure they will plug it themselves but please don't miss um, Carol and Julia's latest book Cracking the Digital Ceiling Women in Computing Around the World which is available at all good university libraries on the CMU campus and if you have a moment I'd encourage you also to check out our latest virtual exhibit by Dr. Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections, entitled Cypherdisks, Renaissance Encryption Machines, which you can find on the CMU Library website. With that, it's a great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Carol Fries to begin this evening's event. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Emma, for inviting us um, it's a real honor for Julia and I to uh, speak in the library speaker series and especially during Women's History Month. So thank you very much for this honor. And today we're going to share our work on women in computing uh, based on uh, the focus is going to be on the two books that Keith mentioned, Kicking Butt in Computer Science, which is tells the Carnegie Mellon story and uh, cracking the digital ceiling, which takes us further afield. Um, it was our studies at Carnegie Mellon uh, that led us to want to find out what was going on with women in computing around the world. 
hand over to Julie. Thank you, Carol. Uh, to provide a bit of background before we begin our talk, we wanted to take a moment to set forward our motivation, um, really beginning to set the stage as to why women's participation in computing really does matter. And we see it mattering for several different reasons. Um, very much at the individual level, the computing field is an, a, a professional opportunity that affords a lot of advantages um, and benefits. And women especially could take advantage of some of these if their participation rates were higher. At an organizational level, there's a growing body of research that points to the business case for diversity, um, looking at ways in which innovation and creative thinking um, can excel uh, with diverse teams. And then at a societal or global level, um, we are facing a global skills shortage in the computing field. And in order to address that gap, it's important that we broaden participation. Um, moreover, there's also a social good component or argument here at play as well. We'd like to share with you some statistics and data to give you a sense of what women's participation in the computing field looks like. Um, to start or to seed that conversation, um, you'll see here a graph that we've taken from the Computing Research Association Tolby survey. This is a report that comes out annually that looks at um, degree attainment in the United States and Canada in several technical fields. This particular screenshot um, demonstrates the number of Bachelor of Science degrees obtained in their most recent uh, study from students pursuing um, computer science and computer engineering uh, degrees. There's some really positive or good things on this slide. As you can see, um, we've really bounced back from kind of the uh, dip that we faced in the early to mid 2000s. Uh, moreover, the growth has been exponential in the last several years. And then finally, the projections for uh, next year are also quite promising. But this doesn't fully paint the entire picture. Um, and I'd like to share with you some statistics uh, that we find to be very troubling. When you look at um, women's participation in computing, uh, the story is quite different. I should mention here that the statistics I'm sharing with you are from the United States and Canada, but later in our talk, we will go deeper into some of the statistics on a global level. But in terms of the United States and Canada, uh, stemming from that Tolby survey that I just spoke to, um, women earned about 21% of computer science degrees in their most recent study, um, keeping this in comparison to just about 50% of the total um, undergraduate degree, degrees women obtain. This is a pretty dramatic difference. If you look at underrepresented minorities, and in particular African Americans and Hispanics, the uh, degree obtainment in computer science is also quite low at only just above 3% and 7% um, respectfully. This number is also a decline from um, the all-time high point in 1984 when women earned about 37% of undergraduate computer science degrees. So not only is the number quite low, again, it's on a decline of where it had been in the 80s. And then finally, looking at the workforce, um, the numbers, although slightly improved, are still quite low at around 26%. I'm going to pass it back to Carol now to share some of the experiences within um, Carnegie Mellon University specifically. Thank you, Jurea. Yes, yeah, so we're going to start with the kicking butt in computer science story, um, which, which tells a very positive story of women in computing. In many ways, we wanted to counteract all the negative stories uh, that were coming out in the media about women in tech who were not feeling comfortable, who were leaving the industry. And we had a very positive story to tell. And we also wanted, uh, we had a, a strong message that we wanted to get across, that it really was culture and environment that we need to address if we want to make change. And by the way, uh, the title, Kicking Butt um, in Computer Science, came from one of the guys in one of our studies. And he had said, the women here kick my butt. So uh, we thought it was um, a nice 
uh, title, a really catchy title to go with. Thank you, Julia. So remember the data that um, Julia men uh, mentioned here, that 21% nationally uh, women gaining a degree in computer science. You can see from uh, this uh, slide that we, we, we have 49% women coming in in 2020. Uh, we really have reached gender balance in our first year class. And we've been higher than national averages for well over 15 years at Carnegie Mellon. So we really do know that women are kicking butt in computer science uh, in any undergraduate uh, major. And what's very important, okay, so we, we see great numbers of women coming into the program, but what's really important is that uh, men and women do graduate at the same rate. So it's not that the women come in and then they leave. They stay and each um, student is tracked at Carnegie Mellon, so we know this. Um, thank you. Now I'm going to give you a very kind of simplistic but overview of the culture uh, in 1995 to 1999. And what we see is um, a very homogenous community in terms of the men, many more men than women, and the men were said to. Uh, believe that they dream in code and that the computer was really a toy that they wanted to just do cool things and play around with it for fun and it was the code itself that was interesting just the code not the effect that it had the women on the other hand wanted to do something useful with the computer at the same time Women were not feeling like they belonged in the program. Many left the program and their confidence was often really low. One woman said that it was extinguished. Now we're gonna move on to uh, 2000 onwards. Uh, we start to see a more balanced culture and environment. We still see uh, um, guys dreaming in code and we love them of course. Um, but we also have women who are very, very keen on programming, especially. We start to see that now the men also want to do something useful. They see the computer as a tool. They want to use their skills now to do something useful, the ability to create something useful. We see that students who are kind of getting rid of that old stereotype that hung around computer science students and recognizing that actually they're quite cool and um, students are happy to be thought of as, as very geeky. So it was in that environment um, that women could thrive. And um, I'm gonna now take us through some of the interventions leading to changes in the culture and environment. So from 1999 onwards, the programming requirement was dropped from computer science admissions criteria. Um, high SAT scores, high math science scores were still in place, but the programming requirement was dropped. And if you think about it, uh, if you know anything about um, the, the history of computing, um, there was a bias when the programming requirement was in place, there was the bias towards, towards men because more boys were taking computing skills or, or learning them at home or in classrooms than, than girls. So dropping that requirement, we started to see a change in the undergraduate student body. Uh, we created various entry levels into the first year courses for students with little to no background. And we start to see not just more women, we did start to see more women, but we also start to see those men who hadn't had that uh, programming background. And with that, with the women and with the uh, different types of men, we see a broader range of characteristics and interests among our students. One thing we want to point out that's important, the curriculum was not changed to be female friendly. It's often, we have had that um, said to us, that how did you change it to be female friendly? But the curriculum at Carnegie Mellon is changed um, to suit all students, not to be uh, just for females. And I think that's um, pretty well uh, established now that that's not something you would do at Carnegie Mellon. 
going on with interventions um, from 1999, the dean at the time, Raj Reddy, it was his vision to produce leaders in the field. And this was a very important moment because it was the start of institutional support for change. Without that institutional support and without it being sustained, uh, we believe that uh, we, we really couldn't have changed, changed a lot. Lenore Blum, uh, joined the CS faculty, bringing this long-standing expertise and advocacy for women in science and math. And, and it was Lenore that actually launched the changes that we were about to see. I joined Lenore in 2000. Um, what we haven't mentioned yet is the development of a student organization, Women at SCS, uh, which was built to ensure that professional experiences, social experiences for women reflect the implicit opportunities that were going on in the majority, in this case, the men. Um, it may seem um, a little strange to say that a student organization could contribute so much to the change in the culture, but most of uh, people in the, in the School of Computer Science I think have come to recognize the value of the student organization because it built a community, community of faculty, staff, students, everyone was involved. I'm gonna dig a little deeper into Women at SCS and the important steps that we've found for successful retention. First of all, that institutional support has been absolutely uh, critical. Um, support from faculty administration, financial to help us do uh, run programs and events, and um, has to fit the values and philosophy of our school. We had to believe that this could happen, that women could bring change. Uh, we've had student leadership. All women that come into the program uh, belong to women at SCS, but we do have committees of graduates and undergraduates that take the lead. And the guiding objectives are really that we want to level the playing field, make sure the women do not miss out, okay? And we also did uh, lots of research studies, monitoring, making sure that the women were doing well, doing as well as the men. Uh, we interviewed men and women, and you'll see, you'll hear more about that later. So one of the biggest things that women at SCS did was building this community across all years and levels. Uh, you know, every, when, as soon as students come in, we, we were welcoming sessions, we run mentoring programs, lots of networking, again, across all years and levels, faculty, staff, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates, a really big community of women all involved. The other thing we focused on was building professional skills taking students to conferences, their real conference experience, practices in public speaking, interviewing uh, practice, invited speakers, and often it's student to student um, doing these practices, teaching each other, um, which is very, very, we found to be really helpful, students hearing from their peers. Another important thing we found has been outreach. We've been, since 2003, we were running uh, roadshows, taking uh, student teams out to work with teachers and K-12 kids and parents, so important to involve the parents, um, talking to them about computer science and demystifying what the field is. Uh, Tech Nights is a program we've had on campus since 2005, and that's specifically for middle school girls. Um, and then also RCS, a research-focused workshop, it's a three-day program we want to encourage undergraduate women, and they come from across the nation, and in fact, from around the world. Um, we want to encourage them to think about the next level, to reach their full potential, maybe go on to graduate school. It seemed natural after a while that uh, we would start another organization. The guys were starting to ask the women, could we come to your uh, events and activities? And um, the, the women, you know, said, okay. So they started opening up events for everyone. 
Uh, but then the next step was to actually start this new organization, SCS for all, keeping, still keeping women at SCS. We still think that's important that women have their space, but um, a new broader, broader student initiative was started with very much the similar goals. Here's just a graphic to show you some of the academic and social events that uh, women at SES and SES for all uh, have, have led. The one on the left there, no faculty allowed. It's true, no faculty allowed. Students get together and they talk about faculty very honestly. They talk about courses um, in a very kind of you know, relaxed environment. They listen to each other. Uh, and it's been very popular. We started years ago and uh, still, still ongoing. And then, of course, you can see some social events like Halloween and Trivia Night. Trivia Night's very special. It involves, again, faculty, staff, students, um, and all, but organized by the committees, the uh, Women at SES and SES, SES for All committees. And now I'm going to hand back to Jaria. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Carol mentioned earlier that research has been a component of these initiatives. And I'd like to share with you a high level summary of some of the activities that have occurred and some of the major themes that have resulted. Um, this slide depicts the five uh, case points or case studies that were held over the last 15 plus years. Um, these uh, case studies consisted of a variety of um, data collection instruments, things like focus groups, face-to-face uh, -face interviews, and also surveys. Uh, data um, was collected or gathered from our undergraduate students, graduate students, and faculty and staff. In the book, we um, go through each of these case studies and then also look at a comparison or um, finding some ways in which themes were similar across those five uh, different case study points in time. And we summarize them into these five themes, um, really thinking about the different pathways or areas for opportunity, how students and in particular female students became um, interested and engaged in computer science. Uh, we look at their perceptions of the field, um, and how students have challenged some of the stereotypes, thinking back to um, some of the information Carol said about um, really kind of owning this idea of a, of a nerd or a geek. Um, we've also looked at their perceptions of individual performance and learning and a culture of inclusion. Um, we wanted to pull out just one snapshot on this notion of culture of inclusion because we find it to be pretty interesting. Um, these are some results from the most recent case study in uh, 2017, where we interviewed face-to-face -face, um, 40 students, 20 um, male students and 20 female students at their second year in their sophomore year of study. Um, reason for that is they've had the opportunity to come in and experience um, the School of Computer Science um, for a bit. And then also this was a cohort that was going through some of the new curriculum for the first time. But what I hope um, you see when, when glancing at these descriptive statistics or the bar graphs is that overall, there are some very positive um, responses here that students are feeling as though they do fit into computer science, both in terms of academics and uh, in terms of their social integration. And then the representative quotes down at the bottom, um, we really do like those that you see on the bottom right, where even just the language choice and some of the verbiage that um, one female and one male student were using to describe their experiences in SCS are, are very, very similar. Um, in terms of major findings or overall takeaways, um, we have found significant evidence that attitudes have changed since 1999. Again, thinking back to that visual graphic that Carol talked us through. Secondly, we're also finding a spectrum of attitudes towards computer science. Um, and many, if not most, or all of these times, there are more similarities between the male and female students than differences. Overall, the sense of belonging has increased, and we're also seeing little evidence of a gender divide. There is only one kind of small caveat or outlier with this, and it relates to perceptions of confidence. What's uh, interesting in the last several interviews, we've asked the students if they feel as though their confidence level has 
increased or decreased since coming um, to Carnegie Mellon. And our female students um, tend to report that their confidence has decreased, whereas the male students um, say it's the same or even have increased. As a follow-up question, we will inquire about their GPA or their actual grades. And the female students are performing on par to the male students. It's really more of a perception of um, their accomplishments. We've talked and looked at this quite a bit, and we really strongly feel that this is more of a reflection of a societal issue than something specific to the School of Computer Science, but uh, it's been something that we, we would like to, to look at even closer going forward. In terms of a, a summary or some closing out recommendations uh, that we've developed from this work at Carnegie Mellon, is that we really want to stress that cultural change is key. It's not gender differences. Um, our studies have found that there are more similarities than differences among the attitudes of um, men and women towards computer science. Um, we also believe it's important to let women, women lead the way. Uh, so just as Carol just described with regard to women at SCS, um, this is a way to ensure that women have a voice and that they're central to the cultural change, which will eventually benefit all. Be open to challenging the status quo. In the case of Carnegie Mellon, uh, there was that programming requirement shift on admissions, but there can be ways in which we can um, tweak or change policies and procedures um, to really improve the environment. Work to level the playing field. So look around to see where the benefits that those in the majority are receiving. Um, perhaps it's things like informal mentoring, um, access to information, professional opportunities, and then try to, to develop interventions or programs um, where everyone will have access to those same type of opportunities. And then recognizing, of course, institutional support is critical. Um, working towards gender parity requires Require, requires resources. Um, it requires buy-in and support um, in terms of our, our values um, and our belief system as well. Dean Webster mentioned in the opening remarks that Carol and I have also completed a second book, um, Cracking the Digital Ceiling, Women in Computing Around the World. And so I'd like to take a little bit of time to share with you some of the themes coming out of this book. Um, really, as we were looking at our work at Carnegie Mellon, um, we saw some wonderful examples of how women were leading the way um, and ways in which culture and cultural shift or changes were making a difference. And so our motivation was to look more globally, um, more holistically, to identify if there are other places where this same type of situation is occurring. Um, and then to go a little bit deeper underneath that and begin to explore what are the various obstacles and or catalysts that are influencing women's participation. The book itself is an edited volume. Um, the chapters represent a range of global and cultural perspectives. We have nearly 20 different country case studies and cross-cultural studies. Uh, some of the chapters are more cross-cultural in nature. Um, the first chapter actually touches on data in over 50 different countries looking at um, information, communication, technology, occupations. Um, we have some regional perspectives looking specifically at Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, Africa, and then about 12 chapters on particular countries to include the United States, Sweden, Russia, India, China, Malaysia, so on and so forth. Getting at that first question uh, that really motivated our work with this book was to identify or, or to find places where women really are leading the way. Um, think back to some of those opening and early statistics that I shared with you with regard to the United States and Canada, women representing about 21% of undergraduate uh, CS degree attainment and about 26% representation in the computing field. Um, here are some examples of places in the world, both um, educationally speaking on the left or within the profession on the right, um, where women's representation is um, almost at parity, um, or even in some cases, slightly above. 
Um, it's important to keep in mind here, though, that even if these um, percentages look very promising and exciting, uh, it's not to say there aren't obstacles or challenges um, that have been overcome or continue to um, impede some progress. And so the book goes a little bit deeper into um, a few of these. Perhaps one of the most interesting, um, maybe even surprising findings um, coming out of this work is that higher levels of societal gender equality does not, does, does not necessarily um, contribute to increased numbers of women in computing. Um, there's little improvement between modern economies and women's uh, participation in computing. That chapter I mentioned that looks at 50 different um, countries in a cross-cultural perspective, uh, written by Tiffany Chow and Maria Charles, um, includes a meta-analysis of women in information communication technology occupations around the world. And they did a comparison of that um, against the Human Development Index, the H HDI, which comes from um, the International Labor Organization. And it's basically looking at ways in which a composite of national income, um, health, and education can begin to classify or organize um, countries and societies on this model of equality. So what you're seeing here on the graph is that many European countries um, that we would consider to be equitable, places like um, Scandinavian countries, Switzerland, Germany, Norway, Finland, um, they actually have some of the largest gender gap um, with regard to college degree attainment and ICT representation. Meanwhile, um, some other countries like the Philippines or Thailand or Ecuador have very strong representation of women, um, yet they have lower rankings for gender parity. So we found this to be quite interesting and, and somewhat surprising. Another really important um, takeaway and theme, something that I, I believe we spoke to a little bit with regard to Carnegie Mellon, is that um, we are not seeing any evidence that differences between men and women and their decisions or lack of a decision to study or pursue a job in computing, um, it does not have anything to do with innate ability or um, biological differences. That in fact, it's cultural factors and cultural shaping that plays the important role in informing um, whether or not a woman um, pursues an opportunity in this space. We wanted to go a little bit deeper in our session today to share with you at least four um, contextual examples, four countries um, where women are sort of kicking butt or cracking the digital ceiling uh, and try to provide some cultural context as to what the many um, catalysts were for this and to an extent some of the obstacles that may um, be playing a part as well. We have a chapter written by Hazan et al. that looks at the context of Israel, which is a really interesting setting. And their work um, looks both at um, students studying computer science, both in the um, Jewish sector and in the Arab sector. Um, overall, combined, women um, are studying computer science in high school at about 32%. Um, but among the um, Arab students, 40% of them are women. So somewhat similar cultural backgrounds and context um, in terms of proximity in place, um, but the representation rates are a little bit different. Um, we have a chapter by Zhang and Yin, also looking at um, the state of China. Um, overall, the number of women practitioners in the computing field is quite small. Um, but it's surprising and an interesting phenomenon then if you look at female entrepreneurs, particularly in the tech startup space, um, a very significant proportion of them, about 55%, are female. Um, again, culture playing a really um, important role as to why this is the case. And um, cultural beliefs and values about um, motherhood and women working seems to be um, really important in this scenario. In terms of India, the Chows and Charles uh, chapter gives some rich statistics. Again, um, some very promising uh, notes and examples here. 
Um, Roli Varma also included a chapter looking at some of those uh, social factors leading to women's participation. Um, she points to some really positive um, considerations, things like the computing industry has um, a lucrative um, component to it that can offer economic independence. Um, computing work also tends to be very clean or safe. You're in a working environment. Um, it's not something that you know is more manual labor um, in nature. And that families tend to encourage uh, women to enter computing. Uh, not to say that there are not obstacles, there can also be some obstacles in place as well. Um, things like travel or um, an inflexible work schedule um, can make it difficult for women to pursue careers in India. Um, Carol and I were also very fortunate to give a talk um, a couple months back with a university in India and the Q&A um, portion of the conversation was really um, quite insightful where uh, uh, many of the participants were sharing with us their experiences growing up in India um, and some of the challenges or barriers that they had to overcome um, to, to end up where they were. And then finally, um, in the case of Malaysia, uh, it seems very clear that boys and girls in Malaysia grow up uh, not believing or having some preconceived notion that one gender is better suited to say a technical field than the other. Um, and many of the stereotypes that we see in the US or in the West, um, those don't tend to hold up in uh, Malaysia either. Um, one other interesting kind of point or takeaway here centers around the notion of choice and what choice means with regard to culture. Um, you know, of course, I think we would all agree um, that having choice and uh, having control to make your choice and autonomy, those can be really, really positive and those are good things. But we have to keep in mind that this choice is situated in some type of social context. And so if the stereotypes are such that, you know, going into a computing field doesn't match with how you identify, or um, if the gender norms paint a picture that women are not welcome in, in a particular space, then would a woman really quote unquote choose to pursue it? Um, and so we found this coming out as a theme in many of the cultural studies where as you know, in the US or many Western countries where women do have a choice and a voice, they're being dissuaded in many different ways leading up to those points where they make a choice that likely they wouldn't do so anyways. Whereas in some other countries, the decision to pursue computing maybe was more of a reflection of their academic performance in math and science. And so if they had performed well there in early education, then they were encouraged slash, you know, not offered a lot of quote unquote choice um, to pursue this area. Um, two last takeaways on the book is we wanted to summarize um, a few of the obstacles that we saw um, throughout the, the various um, country examples. These obstacles had some variation from country to country, but we did try to kind of group them together into some consistent themes. Um, first and foremost, centered on the notion or the image of the field. So if computing was perceived as a very kind of promising positive um, profession, that tended to, to translate in a, in a good way, but many times um, the perception was not positive. It was one that was plagued with some of these stereotypes and negative imagery that we've spoken to, and that had a, a pretty big impact. Um, beliefs about women um, in terms of their intellectual abilities and potential, um, the role of women in a family, um, the expectations of motherhood, and then also the support system surrounding um, women. If they were um, being encouraged um, early on as children by parents or later by teachers and guidance counselors, um, and then once uh, those who did persist and end up in the computing field, if there were support systems to help them um, retain and stay there, things like childcare or lack thereof. But I'd like to end kind of on a happy item. Um, some of the factors that did contribute or were positive um, to women's participation. Uh, again, going back to some of those early motivations that the computing field does tend to be a really rewarding um, opportunity uh, with upward mobility, 
um, opportunities for collaboration and creativity, um, economic independence. Uh, and so those were all things that were really quite um, positive or um, encouraging or um, leading to reasons that um, women would choose to pursue a degree in, in computing or a profession in computing. Um, ability for women to see themselves as a part of the field. Uh, I think there's that very common uh, quote or cliche, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. You know, if she can't see it, she can't be it. So having um, role models or mentors um, or representations of women in computing can be re a really positive um, factor to influence their participation. And then finally, um, quite a bit of evidence on um, policy interventions and um, child, not childhood, um, early education opportunities, um, finding ways to expose uh, young boys and girls to these opportunities, to technology, um, can also be a catalyst um, for their um, future uh, decisions about entering the field. I'm going to pass it back to Carol at this point. And she will end with a summary of some of the themes um, and some of the areas that we also see in terms of the work ahead. Thank you, Julia. So one of the uh, important challenges that uh, Julia and I found in all of this work is this, this idea that men and women have different intellectual potential. We need to challenge that idea uh, in order to, to, to make any progress at all. And yet it seems to be uh, fairly entrenched in our society that men and women think differently. Uh, um, but, but there are two um, great books that we recommend um, coming out of neuroscience, which show that you know, the differences that we, uh, that we perceive are really developed in the culture. From a very early age, we start to um, subtle messages telling our children, um, boys are like this, girls are like that. Um, so we really have to work against that. And it's tough because it is very entrenched in our society. We need to stop perpetuating the stereotypes. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of, if not you've read, this multi-million dollar bestseller from John Gray, The Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which um, takes it so far that, uh, you know, men and women are so different in their thinking, their being, their, you know, their attitudes, they come from different planets. It's one of the, um, I would say in the 1990s, one of the things that contributed to these stereotypes because it was such a bestseller. And it rings true when you read some of the, 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 the comments, but it never looks at the sources of difference. How are these differences produced? And then other, other kind of stereotypes, um, it was the children's place that came out with some of these um, t-shirts and sweatshirts aimed at middle schoolers. You can see the one there with my best subjects. If you go down to the bottom, you see that the math box is not checked. And these were aimed at middle school girls. And then on the, the other side, you see the um, big ideas um, are for boys, whereas girls have to smile. Um, again, these stereotypes. I will say though that parents complained about some of these and uh, Children's Place took some of the t-shirts off the market. So there's an intervention that, you know, families can make. Um, now we were happy to see that Mattel came out with uh, Engineer Barbie, uh, but Jureen noticed that in a series of books that Barbie says, um, I'm only creating the design ideas. I'll need Stephen and Brian's help to turn it into a real game. So mixed messages there that um, the girl can't, you know, do the work all by herself. Um, so these are, these are stereotypes that we need to challenge. Yes, Barbie does have a new career. You know, she's now a game developer, robotics engineer, computer engineer. So we're happy to see this. This all can impact children's uh, attitudes, even though she still has 
uh, the same figure, right? The same uh, skinny body. Um, thank you. So I'm going to finish off here with uh, something you may have seen before or heard about, the, the, the Lego story. So in 1974, uh, Lego wrote to parents telling them uh, with, with, with Lego, um, just let your kids build, let your kid, kids do what they want to do, just give them freedom. Um, because uh, they recognize that building with Legos help de helps develop dexterity, problem solving, uh, uh, simple physics, skills that we need our kids to get, right? Now, by the um, 70s and 80s, uh, th this is kind of what my kids saw when they were playing with Legos. Uh, unisex box, different colors, different shapes. And, you know, we'd been encouraged to let, let our kids uh, just play, just build, just get on with it, right? But by, nine, by, the 20, by 2011, sorry, 90% of Lego consumers were boys. Um, this change in the market started with, you know, Lego appealing to boys, these um, shooting kind of um, plague, plague stuff that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, of course, Lego noticed there was a gap in the market because these were aimed at boys. Uh, so they came out with um, pink Lego. If you ever saw, saw that, it was pink friends. Uh, but it was quite different in many ways to, again, it was perpetuating that divide between boys and girls and what they did and what they, they thought. But then along came this little girl called Charlotte. And I don't know if you know Charlotte, Charlotte's letter, um, but I'll read it to you because it's difficult to see here on the screen. Uh, this is in 2014, by the way. Dear Lego Company, my name is Charlotte. I'm seven years old and I love Legos, but I don't like that there are more boy people and barely any Lego girls. Today I went to a store and I saw Legos in two sections, the pink for girls and the blue for boys. All the girls did was sit at home, go to the beach and shop, and they had no jobs, but the boys went on adventures. They worked, they saved people and had jobs. They even swam with sharks. I want you to go make more Lego girl people and let them go on adventures and have fun, okay? Thank you from Charlotte. That year, 2014, Lego actually did introduce more female scientists, little women figures, right, into their uh, science Legos. And in 2017, we saw more, the Lego introduces its Women of NASA set. So, um, these are interventions as, uh, you know, as members of the public, as families, as teachers, as parents, as children can make and have an impact on how um, we address this difference in women's participation in computer science. Thank you, Carol. Um, we very much appreciate everyone attending this evening, and we hope that these two books have provided some examples of ways in which women's participation in computing can be addressed, uh, and that's by focusing on uh, cultural change and, and cultural areas as opposed to innate gender differences. Um, we recognize there's still much work to remain. Uh, and we hope that these final comments and thoughts have perhaps spurred some creative thinking or ideas um, on your part, how we can all collaborate together going forward. Before I officially end this presentation, I just wanted to take a moment and say congratulations to Carol. She's recently retired and her and I have been working together for gosh, over 15 years. And so we've, basically met every week for hours on end for 15 years. 
And I am just so very excited for you and your new opportunities, but I am also just a little bit heartbroken. And I hope that this isn't our last talk together, but on the off chance it is, it was really wonderful to be able to do it at CMU. So thank you so much to the libraries for giving us this forum to come together and, and really share the, the rich experiences and research and intervention opportunities we've had together. So thank you, Carol, and thank you, everybody. Thank um, you. I'm going to turn it over to Emma now, and I think she's going to facil facilitate the um, Q&A portion of tonight's webinar. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you, everyone, for attending, but mostly thank you to Carol and Drea for coming to speak and giving a very insightful and informative presentation. Um, I, as a woman who grew up in the United States, I saw a lot of parallels to my own experience around how I was encouraged or discouraged. Uh, for discouraged from entering the field of computer science. And I'm happy that I was able to push through some of what you were talking about in terms of notions of choice within culture um, to come back and do a PhD that focused more on using computer science techniques, even if it was from a different angle. Um, so I really appreciate you both providing insights tonight. Um, so we are now, um, as Juria suggested, in our question and answer section of the evening. If you have any questions, please feel free, free to put them in the Q&A session. And I will um, give you all a couple minutes to write those questions while I start off with one of my own. So you mentioned a little bit about the women at uh, CSC at CMU uh, program that you both are heavily involved in. And I was wondering, um, what is an achievement that you are most proud of or impressed by that that group has produced? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so I think I, I am proud of many things that the women in computer science have done. I, I really am. Um, but perhaps um, one thing that really stands out is the way that they have built the community. They've been very inclusive. Um, they've, they've made sure that women feel welcome at all levels and um, years. And they've made sure that the women get to meet the faculty. They made sure that um, women get to meet the graduates to see the next level. I'm really thrilled at the way they've been inclusive and brought, brought uh, faculty, staff and uh, students on board with so many of the programs that they've, they've, they've built. You know, it, I mean, and many of the programs are built for the women, but they've also been inclusive and built this you know, with lots of networking, lots of work, they built this wonderful community. And I'm proud of them. But I also think, you know, from when I talk to staff and faculty in, in the School of Computer Science, lots of people are very proud of the achievements we've made. So uh, it's not, yeah. Thank you. Oh, no, that's fantastic. Um, Drea, did, do you also have something that that you have appreciated about that group as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would agree with everything Carol just described and maybe add to it the sustainability of the group, um, the way in which the students really mentor each other and help to transition um, the various programs and outreach components and the work that they do. Um, I think it would be very easy for this type of an initiative to kind of start and then fizzle out but it continues to be a really integral part of the college and continues to thrive and grow and expand while being agile and, and you know, keeping the pulse on um, current issues and situations. So that's probably the thing that is the most impactful for me. And I, I, think, I think both of what you mentioned is very key in line with what you wrapped up your talk with, which is both inclusivity and working on making those sustainable choices that are really fixed in our culture and not just something that we try to do every once in a while. So I think it's great to see that the women at CMU are taking that to heart and living up to that standard. So we do have some questions from the audience. Um, and our first question comes from Sharon Carver, which is what similarities uh, and differences do you see between gender issues in the SCS and the Dietrich College or really any other part of CMU? 
Maybe I could take that question, Carol, first, and then you add to. Um, first, hi, Sharon. It's great to know you're here. Um, I can't see you, but I saw your name, so that's exciting. Um, I'm in the Information Systems Program, which is a part of the Dietrich College with collaboration and um, the Heinz College as well. Um, when I first joined the program back in 2007, we were a pretty small unit at the time. There were two faculty people and then myself and one other were hired. Um, and we were a pretty small unit too. We didn't have a really big cohort of students. So there wasn't a lot of bandwidth um, to think about women in, in IS at that point. Um, it was more of just sort of surviving and teaching. Um, and so everything that Lenore and Carol had put in place as Carol and I started collaborating together, um, I and my colleagues would try to then kind of carry over best practices to the, to the IS program. Um, so for example, we recently um, launched a, a student mentoring program and our academic advisors put that together, but very much looked at what um, women at SCS had been doing as a part of that. And the mentoring program has been quite successful. Um, we've also put in place some professional development opportunities, invited speakers, um, again, similar to what SCS had done. Um, and then we've also engaged in some research projects um, Beth Whiteman at the Eberly Center has helped us with a sense of belonging study. Um, I'm working with a small group of um, students as a part of an independent study to look at growth mindset within the IS program. So I think the actions and the activities are similar in that we're replicating many of the best practices. Um, among the students themselves, I also think there are some similarities uh, to that come to mind. Um, we're seeing high sense of belonging, um, much like uh, the SCS students. And then we're also seeing um, a diversity of attitudes and experiences and interests that span across our male and female students, that it isn't this gender divider or dichotomy, it's much more streamlined. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective and, and good to know that the methods are being expanded beyond the SES department. So I think it's something all women around CMU could benefit from, and as well as our uh, non-binary members as well. Um, so another question we have comes from Susie Lorich McIntyre. Um, what are recommended actions that K through 12 schools can take to better support girls and young women who are interested in ICT in the US that you heard of from other countries? Good question. Well, I think um, what jumps to mind immediately is again, this idea that, um, you know, if we, if we encourage our children to grow up thinking that boys and girls are um, intellectually capable, right, of doing almost anything, we may have, they may have different, what we found was some very different social expectations, right? Some of the poorest countries, the social expectations on women were really very heavy, but they still didn't have this, um, belief that the intellectual expectations were different, which is kind of interesting. So I think we really do need to work on that with our children and be careful, uh, teachers, parents in our schools to not pass subtle messages along. Uh, sometimes we don't even know we're doing it right. And we pass these subtle messages along. Um, and I know there's a lot of research in um, education that shows uh, teachers often pick on the boys to answer questions and the girls leave the girls to be quiet. You know, this is, this, this. Susie actually, I'm, hi Susie, thanks <laughs> for the question. Susie knows a lot more about this, I think, that, that, than I do for sure about the education system, but that would be, and challenging stereotypes again. You know, challenging stereotypes is something that I think we have to be careful of all the time. Lots of schools, and now uh, I'm hearing that um, they're starting their own clubs for girls. I know that we've done roadshows in, in, in local schools uh, where we've gone out and talked to a, a girls club, a girls computer club. Um, and they've, they've really valued that. So I think when girls can get together, 
that there's some evidence that um, you know it's not the boys in the we were told it's not the boys in the room that stop the girls it's the girls not having other girls not bringing a girlfriend with them so sometimes these girls clubs can can have a big impact on 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 the attitudes of the girls feeling favorable to competing Sharia, did you want to add to that as well or yeah um i i think the the part i would add centers on the conversation about making um, computing a required part of the K through 12 curriculum. I think in the United States, it tends to not be, um, you know, just because there's so much focus on the other areas um, that are required subjects and a lack of funding or resources. Um, but we did see some examples where um, computing was a requirement of school and it was that early exposure. Um, whether students wanted to do it or not, uh, would open up, you know, some ideas or thoughts, uh, another entry point, if you will. So I won't go as far as to say we need to make it required in the United States, but I think finding ways to infuse or interject opportunities within the school system would, would be nice and useful. Yeah, can I just add something to that? Because you really reminded me, um, yeah, teacher certification here in the U.S., it is very low. Not all states um, have that um, in place to get teachers certified in computer science. So um, students often tell me that they they took computer science classes from their uh, gym teacher or you know somebody that you wouldn't expect, right? Because because we're very short of computer science teachers. saying um, just now, Carol, that being able to see yourself is a reason to go forward and be a part of that discipline, especially for computer science, which might encourage once we have, you know, a lot more computer science, there will probably be more people who also want to share that knowledge and teach. And so I think that's a, that's a great point coming back up to that. Um, hey, another question that we have is um, from Elizabeth uh, Whiteman, um, who thanks you both as well, as I should say, so have most of our questioners, uh, for your exceptional work. Um, for CS and IS graduates, are there opportunities for the community, uh, CS for all, women in CS, to continue beyond graduation for connection, for advocacy, and smashing the glass ceiling in tech? I love that question. And hi, Beth, I mentioned you in my comments. I didn't realize you were here too, but um, Beth is the expert at the Everly Center who's worked with us in the IS program on, on some of our studies. So thank you, Beth, so much for, for the collaboration. Um, in terms of IS, I'll let Carol speak to SCS. Um, we have not formalized anything at this point, but I like the question. It definitely makes me think of some ideas. Um, we do have a pretty tight um, connection with our alumni. Um, and so we've used them quite a bit as a part of, um, we've, we've used some alumni as advisors in many of our project-based courses. Um, and so that's an opportunity for them to come back and connect with our students. Um, we've also incorporated some alumni, invited them to, back to give um, guest talks and things like that. But in terms of a, a formal program or pathways, um, it's, it's no, I, I would say there isn't a lot there right now, but definitely an area to focus on for the future. I don't know, Carol, you probably have more to say. Yeah, that. so yeah. Um, it's an interesting question because I think um, it's one of the issues we've talked about that, and I think um, Lenora at one point wanted to do a study of this, that, um, you know, we, 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 we produce these wonderful graduates and they've been in this program where the women have been um, very active and, and, you know, cracking the ceiling um, in, in the school itself. But um, once they go out into industry, they often find it different. Um, and they struggle a bit more because they've, 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 we need to prepare them, in other words, a little bit more but when they do go out into industry and find that maybe they're the only woman in their team, you know, it really does depend on, on the company. We've, we've got some great companies and I hear wonderful feedback from students, 
but I also hear that you know some of them are, um, really miss having the the women around them. Um, as Julia pointed out, we, we've also done um, events with our with our alumna, um, bringing them back and um, keeping those connections going. Uh, yes, I think that I think that's important. But I think we could probably uh, do more um, in terms of preparing them especially the activists that we already have that could, could do so much, I think. Completely agree. And I, I think too that this next question might fit in a little bit to the idea of increasing activism um, to increase diversity. Um, so we have one person who has a question about how you might apply the lessons and strategies you have learned over the years to increase diversity in terms of race, ethnicity, and foreign students. That's a really great question. And um, Carol and I have thought about this a lot and we recognize that our focus has primarily been on women in computing and, and gender, but looking at race, ethnicity, our foreign students, those are all really important as well. Um, I think those five takeaways that I summarized from the story of CMU would be relevant. Um, institutional support, um, leveling the playing field, uh, looking for opportunities for students to take on leadership. Um, you know, that those opportunities that come to students in the majority, that there are venues, programs, interventions to make those opportunities more widely available. All those themes I think are consistent, um, how they are sort of realized or the nuances beneath them, I think would, would of course matter by context and place, but as a category of things, I, I believe those to be consistent. Yeah, I think Jaria makes makes good points there. Yeah, I agree with, with that. Um, and, um, you know, with women at SCS, um, yeah, we found that affinity groups, I think, are very, are very um, worthwhile. Um, certainly in School of Computer Science, we do have to work harder um, with different groups, right, with diversity. We haven't got anywhere near uh, where we should be. But the school is starting to pay attention. And I think it's that when you, that's where we began with women. We started to pay attention. We started to listen to the women and um, move forward with, with women uh, helping direct the, the way. And I think we have to engage our minority students in that way too. We've really got to, to bring them on board, make them feel welcome. If you don't have a good social fit, I, mean, I know that research has found that if you don't have a good social fit in your school, um, you're not going to do so well academically, no matter how you know, brilliant you are. We've got to encourage our students to, to, to work together to build those social relationships. They're so important. Helping to build that sense of belonging. We want our, our minority students to feel like they belong. But we still have a long way to go with that, for sure. But how encouraging that in the recent research that you have been doing, at least with women um, at CMU in these fields, that there are parities between um, how comfortable socially men and women feel within the department. I think that's a great success of, and part of an outcome of both of your work here at CMU. Um, so we do have another question, um, which is, again, Thank you for speaking. Just wanna make sure that Andrew McGee's thanks is passed along. Um, did, did your surveys of and interactions with women students in computer science reveal historical or historical figures or particular moments in the past that women cited as inspirations? Yes, I mean, the person who comes to mind first and foremost is probably Grace Hopper in that um, Carol mentioned conferences, sending students to conferences. Many of them have attended the Grace Hopper celebration. Um, and so learning about her history and her contributions to the field of computing, I think that has come up quite a bit in the research. Yeah, for sure, Grace Hopper. I'm just trying to think of, of, of particular names um, 
but he, but even uh, our uh, our own faculty, you know, students would mention our own faculty uh, women, you know, as somebody they can relate to, and our graduate students too, actually. Yeah, um, I I think that's actually a good segue into um, not a question but a comment that we had from one of our members, um, Joanne Wright who I'll just say their whole message in full. Thank you and congratulations on your work, your books and the CS program development at CMU. I graduated from CMU in 1971 in mathematics, one of the few female students and credit CMU for a successful career in computing. Your presentation made me want to be an 18 year old at CS student again. To the students out there, you go for it ladies. So I think that, I think that, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to know that, you know, we, we do have alumni in the room, we have students in the room, and it is through this very connection that we can, you know, continue to learn from the women at CMU who have done CS work both within the department and then sharing that with the rest of us as well, which I know that I benefit from and I'm excited to continue working with you all to develop across the campus. Um, so we do have, um, one more comment I'll share and then we'll wrap it up because we're almost at time. Um, so uh, uh, Lauren Blum will say that um, Jerry said one might think a student organization like women at CSC uh, could easily fizzle out. I think it's very important to point out that since 1999, women at CSC um, has had professional leadership who have supported the students and their initiatives and who have done constant fundraising support all uh, to support all the students activities without this leadership there's the danger that the program and its success could fizzle out um i hope with carol's retirement that the program will continue and i yeah and i definitely agree with that sentiment as well and i think i can speak for the libraries and if Keith has a problem with it he can come talk to me but any support that you need from us um to help in, in your efforts, um, we're definitely here to help you do and providing spaces like this to invite um, Carol and Jaria, speakers like yourselves to provide not only your own perspective um, on your time at CMU, but also what is possible for our students is fantastic. Um, and it's this type of community that you have provided that's leading to the success of the program as well. So with that, I'll say a big thank you to our speakers Everybody wants to virtually applaud. <laughs> and um, we can uh, bid you all good night. Thank you for staying uh, so late after work on a Thursday. Um, and we hope to see you at some of our future library events as well. <laughs>